live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Q at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Boston, Massachusetts for HP Vertica Big Data Conference. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, and we're here with, uh, with Peter Fishman, Director of Analytics at Yammer. Last year was on theCUBE, CUBE alumni, back for second straight year. Welcome back. Round two. We had a great interview last year. I do remember some of the comments. I was kind of like, hey, what's going on with the integration with Yahoo? Apparently that, I mean, uh, not Yahoo, Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft. Um, <laughs> it's hard to compare the two. One's worse than the other. But um, Microsoft obviously ingested you guys and integrated into the organization. So let's get, the, before we go into some of the cool data stuff, talk about the integration with Microsoft because um, David Sachs is no longer with the company. That's the, that was broken and also the, as news. And also, the, you guys weren't mentioned on the Microsoft uh, recent earnings report. Some were saying, hmm, what's that mean? Is it means it's just been in integrated into other products, or has it been taken out as a separate as a separate division? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm a very proud Yammer employee. I uh, have been at Yammer for um, just about four years, and um, you know, we're still on our mission, uh, which is essentially to define to find social within enterprise. And uh, you know, Yammer is now definitely a part of Microsoft. So. Um, geographically, we're not based in Redmond, we're not based in greater Seattle. Um, a vast majority of the Yammer team is uh, still in San Francisco. We're right along Market Street, uh, really the heart of uh, you know, what we call the Silicon Bay. Um, uh, I would say that uh, one of the reasons you might not be seeing uh, you know, the Yam Yammer as a specific uh, line call out in, uh, in Microsoft's revenue is one, Microsoft makes a giant amount of revenue, uh, and two, uh, we sort of view ourselves as part of Office. You know, our job is really to uh, you know, be a really valued part of uh, Office and, and especially the O365 experience. So I, I'd say that we sort of find ourselves really in the O365 world and, uh, and the, the cloud component well, of Microsoft's enterprise offering. You should be proud to be in uh, the CUBE alumni status of Satya Nutella, who's the CEO, who's been on the CUBE uh, before yeah. at, uh, at Stanford when we had the CUBE there, Dave. Less views than you, Peter. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, uh, but his whole vision of cloud, cloud first, uh, is really cool. I like that. It was you know, something we heard. Uh, we've been saying data first is kind of the next wave coming. You're going to hear mobile first, cloud first first and soon to be data first. Um, but recently the trends are all about mobile, new user experiences. What have you, what have you seen? Because you guys were really the pioneers in this enterprise social trend. Yeah. You know, Facebook for the enterprise, some called it. But now you're seeing things like BuzzFeed get $50 million in funding at an $800 million valuation. Uber's blowing up like crazy. Completely disruptive market. So that social is now happening. Social business is now native. In, in advertising and then the collaboration. What's changed, what's the new thing? Uh, well, I mean, I, I still think uh, social has a ways to go. Uh, I don't think anybody has entirely figured out um, where social's going to be in the enterprise. So uh, we still have uh, a ways to go with our product in terms of being uh, that true many-to-many -many communication that everybody uses within their company. Um, now, from a, a personal standpoint, I've really uh, enjoyed the transition uh, to Satya. I, uh, I've, I've, you know, he's come down to um, the Yammer office and uh, given one of his uh, monthly uh, uh, sort of talks to the entire uh, Microsoft org uh, right from uh, Yammer headquarters. So that was uh, very cool. That was probably a few months ago. Um, what I really like is that he gets up in front of uh, the entire team, fields questions, nothing's, nothing's rigged, all the questions come in on Yammer and he's able to really address it with uh, a great vision. I think that, I think we're really aligned to um, Satya's vision of the world and it also uh, plays nicely for me because he's such a big believer in data. Um, and I think that Microsoft is really um, making that, that move into the data space in a way that I hope is really exciting. So talk about the analytics piece. You're here obviously for the big data event. Um, we were talking last year about uh, the analytics. Um, 
really important part of the, the ecosystem going forward. You're giving a talk here, data to dollars. Um, what is that about? Give a preview of your, your talk. Yeah, I think um, there's many ways to view data. So one, it, it is an expense. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, costs associated, um, not just hardware or software. There's costs in terms of people, uh, in terms of providing data. Um, and, and also um, opportunity costs, taking those people that could be doing something else creative and having them work you know, on essentially the numbers. Um, so people often focus on some of the costs of data and they want to see, hey, how does data provide cost reductions to sort of counterbalance uh, all of the other costs? Um, really, that's missing <laughs> the point, which is we want the data to accelerate the product, accelerate the revenue streams for the product, such that um, you know, we don't just get a return uh, in terms of cost reductions, but also in terms of revenue enhancements. Um, and what's great about, uh, I, guess, I guess, a conference like this is that you see so many different industries represented. Uh, myself, I'm coming from, uh, before I was uh, in essentially social enterprise, I was, worked in social games. And um, you couldn't imagine two more different worlds uh, if you think about sort of uh, the Farmville style application versus an enterprise software application. And uh, seeing sort of data span that world all the way into mine has is, is been actually rather interesting. And you hear stories that are all sort of not uniform insofar as the applications are different. Um, and also essentially the ways that you can affect revenue are different. Um, but a lot of the sort of data war stories, stories are very similar. So Peter, it's interesting to hear you talk about sort of the, folk, the intense focus on cutting costs sort of misses the point, and, and I would agree with that. At the same time, it, it, it is largely about economics, right? Sure. Because you could now do things that you couldn't do before, because it's just much more cost effective. So maybe the impetus was not to save money, it's to make money, but you wouldn't have been able to do it in the past. Is that, is that a fair premise? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, well, I think the entire economics of uh, sort of the ROI to data needs to be revisited. Because what we're, what we're constantly seeing is, you know, storage costs and compute costs being driven further and further down. Um, which means that uh, the types of data that you collect, it used to be that maybe the marginal cost was so high to collect a certain amount of data that you couldn't actually get those returns on that data until you had sort of enough of it. Um, and now if you think about the entire world of what we can collect, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not even talking about sensors, I'm talking about just, just in, a well-instrumented product it can give you so much information um, and sort of the ability to wade through it is, is really critical, but the whole economics of, um, of data analysis, data science, has totally changed with, um, with, with the cost being driven down, and now that we're collecting things, um, we sort of stumble into ways that the data can be useful. Last year, you had a great quote on theCUBE. We were talking about um, people remember, they look for what's working and what's not working, and you mentioned something to the fact that focus on what's not working. And a lot of people, poker uh, pros, win, forget, remember their hands they lost on and walk away from those versus the amateurs, like the winners. I remember that part of that conversation. Okay. How has that changed with A-B testing and things that we talked about last year in a year? Has anything come about in your mind from a trend standpoint, technology and innovation, a new discovery? I mean, certainly Spark has been interesting to see the innovation around you know, in memory. Is there anything new coming out that you're seeing that's going to facilitate more of that kind of data for A-B testing? Sure. So, um I think uh, people think that experimentation is a panacea for, uh, for solving all causality-like issues, right? So um, it used to be that we would see things move together and there would be some correlation between these two variables and you would intuit that relationship. Um, and then uh, the ability to do experiments uh, basically solve the issue in some sense of correlation versus causation. So when we run experiments, um, if we properly randomly assign um, for the most part, we can distinguish between group A and group B, and we can look whether there's an economic lift and whether there's a statistical lift. Um, but it actually hasn't fully solved uh, this problem. First off, um, not always are your tests very cleanly implemented. So um, real practitioners know that uh, things happen, so your test might not be as you intended it to be. 
Um, and then you also sometimes run into the uh, problem of small samples. So if you think about a product like Bing, uh, you know, the, the sample sizes are uh, gigantic. So um, there, I think it's, it's a much more trivial task to get to statistical meaning. Um, even still, you're going to want to make sure that your random assignment actually looks like a fair random assignment. I mean, some of the noise that you introduce is by not sort of, you might do the assignment randomly, but that doesn't mean you get an unbiased sample. And you want to make sure that the experiment is what's causing the differences between the two groups. So I think some of the interesting things that have come out in A-B testing have been around, you know, how do you really make, uh, make the race a fair race in your experiment such that you're really drawing a causal inference that the thing that you changed between condition A and condition B, or however many conditions you have, is actually what's driving the difference between uh, your two groups. So how do you apply that basic concept, philosophy, boundary conditions, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in your situation with Yammer? Because yeah, you're absolutely. servicing you know, multiple enterprises, not just one big homogeneous group yep. of people. So talk about how you use analytics and, sure. and, and address that issue. So I think we publicly discuss um, having over you know, 10 million users uh, in the enterprise and, all, and you know, having uh, near half a million um, companies and uh, using the product. And, and you know, if you think about those numbers, um, you can get to uh, be able to detect really small UI changes as having uh, a benefit uh, or, or cost um, to the product. That said, actually sometimes you want to really narrow in on um, maybe certain geographies or certain user types or certain uh, network types. So um, what, we're, what we're really interested in doing is, is figuring out how to, you know, I think one of the themes that we talked about uh, last year was cheaply doing analytics. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the, the theme that I try to drive with my team. Cheaply sharing analytics, but cheaply implementing um, an analysis that's able to tell you, you know, whether or not you've actually created a lift. So um, and thinking about what's the cheapest way to implement this test, um, if you're able to get away with smaller and smaller sample sizes, um, that essentially uh, drives down the cost of doing experimentation. Okay, so uh, it's kind of counterintuitive though, right? Everybody's talking about how sampling is, is dead, right? <clears throat> We're gonna, Colin talked this morning about infinite sample sizes. That's right. So you're saying that your analytics is a function of the sample size? Well, so, I mean. Oh, the uh, your analytics sure, cost, uh, I mean. So, uh, say, yeah. so, so uh, I, I want to dive into this. Um, I like the idea of sample size infinity. Right, so when you have when you have a giant n, you know, then essentially your you know your standard deviation is gonna gonna be shrunk so that you can essentially make a better statistical inference. Um, uh, the catch is that you actually you know might want to you know, and and when he says infinity, he means things that kind of approach infinity. And sure. um, if you're trying to make the inference for a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller uh, population. You're sort of trading off your giant N versus uh, making an inference for a subpopulation. And if you, you thought about sort of um, the best case scenario, you'd be designing things at the individual level and testing it on every single individual. But there you'd only have a sample size of one, so you wouldn't know if you were really actually affecting a good change. So, uh, so when we say like, you know, are samples blowing up? Absolutely. Are we collecting more data? Absolutely. Um, do products like Yammer have giant user bases through virality um, and through some of the Microsoft distribution channels? Absolutely. Um, but, but then you get greedy and you want to go even, uh, even more deep and define at even a lower level um, where is your product change effective and for what groups and for what segments. And that's a situation where your marginal costs don't go to zero. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right? Right, your, exactly. your costs are proportional so, to so now the number of individuals that you right. have to profile. So now right? if you want to segment up your populations, then essentially you're shrinking your sample sizes. So how about, can you share with us, Peter, something that maybe surprised you in your, in your analytics, you know, recent analytics career? You know, I, I think with respect to uh, Yammer, we do a lot of um, what I hope is uh, um, fun, boring work. 
right? So we run experiments and we um, call the winners of the experiment based on knowing what our North Star is. So we know exactly what we think uh, moves the needle for the company. And when we run an experiment, we evaluate many metrics, but that aggregates up into a recommendation. Um, so that in and of itself is not uh, routine because it is our sort of day-to-day -day lives, but it, it, it's not um, sexy and exciting other than, you know, when something wins, it's potentially interesting and you want to figure out what was the driver of that win. And when something loses, it's potentially interesting because you want to, you know, have a sharp opinion as to what the direction the product needs to go, what's the learning uh, essentially from that loss. So, so it might be cool and surprising to know just that the number of losses is, is always more dramatic than you expect, right? So if you ask, you know, a product manager, you know, what's the probability that this feature is going to be successful? Ex ante, it's almost always 100%. Uh, 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 so, uh, <laughs> so I want to get into predictive analytics, but I want to, before we get there, I want to ask you some trending questions. We have a lot, sure. of, a lot of folks interested in this. In Silicon Valley, the hot topics right now is, you know, depending on what form you go to is, can product guys be good CEOs? And should CEOs come from a product background? And the other topic I want to talk about is growth hacking. Okay. Growth hacking is something that's uh, been part of the consumerization trend. Very data driven. Absolutely. Um, very analytic driven in terms of you know A/B testing, all kinds of A/B, C, D, E, F, G testing. Product CEOs. Do you think that CEOs um, in this day and era, with full stack or however you want to categorize the kind of startups and growing companies, should come from a product product background? Um, so I, I think this is a very relevant question uh, to be asking uh, someone from Yammer. Again, you mentioned our, our former CEO, uh, David Sachs, a uh, real product visionary. Um, uh, David really uh, sort of saw the social movement and what it was going to become in 2008, and as a result, you know, we have Yammer today. Um, so in thinking a, a little bit about kind of what, what a, you know, a CEO might look like, David argues that you know, a CEO has to you know, be a product person who's really a dictator. And ideally, you have a benevol benevolent dictator. And it's one of sort of his more recent tweets. Is he a benevolent dictator? Uh, well, you know, David, <laughs> David's no longer a yabber. We, we had a great working relationship. And I think uh, what's interesting was that I would not have guessed at first, that he would be so receptive to um, having such a valuable analytics team because he's a he's a person with a real vision for what the product should be, um, and David really embraced um, analytics along with uh, our co-founder uh, Adam Pizzoni. So, um, so I think of them as uh, very benevolent dictators, although. Um, you know, what makes a great product guy, product so, product person, so, or VP of product, or head of product? So David makes the point that uh, the product person has to say no. So it's very, you know, it's very common that you hear multiple uh, opinions, and you you, you want to do the easiest thing, which is, you know, people with, uh, you know, uh, great social skills know know that compromise is absolutely critical. So what you want to do is essentially take the take the sort of middle ground. Where, where is that everyone can be slightly unhappy? And David argues that this can be product death, right? So, um, What, by appeasing people? By appeasing people, then you're essentially cutting corners and making a compromise on the product. And um, in many senses, um, by not doing that, you kill um, sort of uh, working capital. You kill, kill sort of your social capital in the workplace. And in, in doing so, you end up with you know, a person who's sort of forced into the, you know, in, in maintaining that great product, you're, you're forcing yourself into the corner of being uh, sort of. Pissing people off. I, I, Maybe. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, no, that's so, the way to put it. No one sure. likes a no op, literally. Uh, no no I, op yeah, in the yeah. sense of the no, I'm saying no yeah. all the time. Well, what I hope is that um, analytics uh, can mitigate that to some extent, right? So. Um, yes, you're driven by the big vision of someone that has has that big vision, but sort of all of the all of the mini details can get sorted out by the users, not by the cacophony of opinions that that every you know everybody's adding to any specific product feature, but by um, you know by your millions of users um, and knowing kind of what metrics indicate that they've actually had an improved experience. So what I hope is that. Um, yes, that might be the reality of um, having a really strong opinion around product might be necessary to build that great product. Um, but to, you know, sort of to avoid a really harsh dictatorship, I think you need analytics in place. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a big debate. I see that all the time. It's looking at Hacker News, certainly, in all the forums. Uh, I'm a big believer in product, I being the CEO. I'm a, pro I'm a product person in general. But at some point, operationally, you have to scale. Look at Steve Jobs, Tim Cook's relationship. At some point, you know, the operational machinery needs to print the money. But until you get there, I think product, having an eye on the product is critical. Um, growth hacking, that's a sure. big thing that uh, startups do, and a lot of times it backfires. I mean, how many times have you gotten an email, oh, my friends joined the social network, can you join too? I mean, LinkedIn first started growth hacking with the network effect with you know, mm -hmm. sucking your emails, now it's sucking your contact book, uh, address book on mobile, creating these networks. What's your take on growth hacking and the role of data? Yeah, Certain, certainly great title. I'm a growth hacker, and you know, I don't know who... Uh... First of all, I see that on someone's <laughs> business card, I definitely don't hire them on the spot. Good growth <laughs> hackers. Don't put it on their, on yeah, their yeah, business cards, yeah, come it's on. Funny. It's funny, uh, That's like I'm a social media expert, come on, what the hell does that mean? Um, well, I, I would <laughs> love to coin myself a social media expert and a growth hacker. Um, I, think, you know, I think a lot of roles require that. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a data geek first and foremost, um, but essentially all of those skills that go into uh, you know, understanding uh, the social space and understanding um, Essentially, uh, how but what a is growth hacking? Grow. And you're de define growth hacking. Yeah, so I, I think it, it sort of just literally means f doing any and everything to have that product grow at a you know exponential or quasi exponential rate. Now, um, you know, in, in thinking about sort of some famous growth hackers, I mean, uh, Chamath, who was uh, you know face <laughs> Facebook's head of growth hacking, if you will, head of growth, um, was an investor in Yammer, and and you know we try to essentially bring some of um, the best practices of our predecessors in the social space. As I mentioned, I came from social games. So um, social games sort of wrote the book on, on what, you, you know, sort of the, the down and dirty growth hacking, which is to say, doing whatever it takes, you know, having uh, viral loops within the games, having viral prompts within the games. Everything was about, is this product viral? And whatever that means. It means basically, does it have a K factor close to one? So if you can, you know, I think the willingness to do all sorts of creative things uh, to get your K factor high is what's, what's, uh, what I think of as uh, growth hacking. And, um, what are know, some failed growth hacks that you can point to in the market that you say that was a fail? And then some successes. Well, I mean, you, you sort of always have this trade off in growth hacking between um, doing something that makes your product a little bit cheesy uh, versus, and, and maybe unusable and undesirable, uh, versus growing more rapidly. So you could imagine a world where we're constantly popping something in your face, hey, invite this colleague, invite that colleague. Uh, uh, hey, uh, you know, you can only post a message if you invite 10 more friends or, or you post it to your social media feed or something like that. And um, those types of techniques seem to me to work in the short run. So if you're under extreme pressure uh, to blow up your application, um, you, you could imagine any of those techniques that were really um, prevalent at the, you know, sort of the end of the last decade for blowing up some social games um, could really imagine applying in almost any so industry. Let me give you an example of, of, of a, a potentially growth hack on fail. So I'm looking at Facebook right now on my laptop and I was just this weekend on Facebook saying in my social graph, hey, looking for a place in December to bring my family. Uh, I'm looking for a beach, here's a criteria, crowdsource, great, a bunch of answers. And one of the questions was, hey, go to Hawaii, which we've been to many times. So I hit the, hit the Sheraton um, in Maui website to check rates. And now I can't get this freaking retargeted ad off my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And I'm so pissed off at Sheridan right now. I'm just looking at this image. I'm like, I'm done with you. So it's the point now where it's so intrusive and so and making me so angry. It's retargeting, yeah. but that's what they're doing. They're doing retargeting. What's wrong with that analytics? Certainly it's a fail for Sheridan because yeah. now my brand equity sure. to Sheridan is going in the toilet because Absolutely. I'm looking at their ad knowing that they're pissing me off. Sure. I'm not interested. Yeah, so I think that that just uh, revisits uh, my initial claim, which is a short run, long run trade off. So, you know, you getting stalked by Sheridan actually does probably increase the likelihood of you booking it this time. You happen to be annoyed by it, so it's hurting the Sheridan brand, right? So, this is a growth hack that has a short run versus long run trade off. In your case, it's actually costing them in both dimensions. Statistically, it probably works for them with the retargeting that yeah. they'll get more conversion on site, but for me as an individual, Absolutely. I'm turned off. Exactly, so, so balancing that, I mean, one of the things that we talk a lot about at Yammer is that ultimately um, product decisions are made by the product team. 
So um, often, you know, we're at a big data conference and we, and we talk about A-B testing and we talk about kind of how you can use experiments to figure out what's working and what's not working in your product. Um, but that should all be taken with a grain of salt, right? Which is to say, we might be striving for a local max. And I think this is one of the common criteria, uh, criticisms of analytics, which is, you know, if you think about um, a variety of product space, and if you think about kind of measuring awesomeness, we should be great at measuring short run awesomeness. And in many senses, what an analytics team does is tell you uh, with high degree of precision, what's the difference between condition A and condition B? Um, what it doesn't do is tell you whether or not there's a condition C out there. So we're great at telling you about our local maxes. We're great at telling you about some short run effects. Um, but ultimately, our product decisions uh, remain with our product team. We're not like uh, sort of uh, machines in terms of, well, we just got all the data, and this it says up, therefore we now release it. That's not at all how we do it. We try to maximize our learnings from any experiment. Uh, the point of the experiment is not just to call a winner, it's to learn. And um, it's for the product team to know uh, what we think the economic and statistical uh, lift is of this particular product choice. So when the product team owns the, event, the ultimate decision, um, they're the ones with the deepest view into product, into the product roadmap, into the product vision, so that you know that you're not sort of settling on a local max. Peter Fishman, Analytics Director at Yammer, guru in the industry. You're here talking on site uh, here at the Vertica Big Data in, in, in Boston. Messers, we're live. This is theCUBE. Go to crowdchat.net and check out our new engagement container technology. We're hosting the conversation there on the hashtag HP Big Data 2014. Go there and join the conversation. You've got to log in, OAuth in with LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Check out the new product, crowdchat.net slash HP Big Data 2014. That's the hashtag, our new social media innovation. Um, final question, I'll give you the final word. Tell the folks out there in your own words that are watching, we have thousands of people online right now watching. Tell them in your own words, why is this big data movement around analytics such a game changer for startups, big companies, and ultimately for society? Yeah, again, it goes back to uh, the theme of my talk uh, on the show last year, which is, it's about um, cheapness, and it's about distributing information really inexpensively. And when we do that, we basically uh, get all of the opinions aggregated, and that there is a total, a real incredible value um, to aggregating all these opinions and for people to have a really deeper understanding of it, and that you're not sort of relying on somebody with just incredibly deep expertise, that instead you can actually know what's happening in your product uh, when you're making those decisions. Peter, thanks for joining us Always in theCUBE. Great to uh, have your perspective, and uh, you, know, you guys are pioneers, and you're certainly in the forefront of an amazing industry. I think, you know, obviously data science, well documented now, Wall Street Journal article this past week about the future of data science um, careers. It's good validation for me. I sent all my kids, and like I tell them two years ago, data science, like, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. So I feel vindicated <laughs> myself, but uh, data's hot. You're a player. Thanks for joining theCUBE. Yeah. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. After the short break, this is theCUBE. Thanks, guys.